दुश्मन है Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Grammatical Features of First Nations School-Aged Children, Valuing Linguistic Diversity, featuring Pat Hart Blunden. I'm Sandy Nichol. I'm AXPA's Director of Professional Practice. So just a couple of housekeeping items before we get rolling. All attendees are joined in mute, so you won't be able to chat. Um, in order to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. So there's, you'll notice at the top of your screen, there's little interlocking thought bubbles with question marks on them. We'll be responding to questions at the end of the session, but please do ask those questions as they come to you throughout the session. And you can upvote questions by clicking on the thumbs up for a particular question in case you have a question that's similar or you think, ooh, that was a really good question. So now I'd like to just kind of get on to why we're here today. So that today we're welcoming Pat Hart Blunden, PhD. She's a practicing speech language pathologist with 40 years of experience working with children, youth and adults, their families and service providers in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Alberta, Quebec and BC. So pretty much all across the nation. Pat's research focuses on First Nations, English varieties and educational settings and in particular, grammatical features that are often mistaken as being indicators of language disorder. Pat has presented and published her work in British Columbia, elsewhere in Canada, and in the US. She has also consulted to schools in Northern BC, where the majority of children are First Nations ancestry. Being first and foremost a practicing clinician, she's interested in creating new knowledge via research and then applying it in educational and clinical settings in ways that value linguistic diversity. So without anything further, I'd like to say welcome, Pat, and we are now in your hands. You're good to go, Pat. Okay, I didn't. Sorry, folks. We had a big discussion before I started about seeing a red, a red circle, and I don't see it, so I was waiting. Anyway, thanks so much for having me. I'm really pleased to uh, share this uh, work that I've done. It's something I'm quite passionate about, and of course, the title of my presentation is "Grammatical Features of First Nations School-Aged Children Valuing Linguistic Diversity." And just a couple of words of warning. Um, I have a terrible memory. And so if I'm looking off to the left, it's because I've got two devices going simultaneously, one of which I'll use to uh, refer to my speaker notes. And I'd also like to say that for some of you who were um, at my presentation a few years ago to your college association, um, some of this will sound uh, a bit familiar, but I'm hoping with another go around at it that you will gain a different perspective and plus I do have a few updates. So here we go. So I want to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands. I'd also like to acknowledge with respect that I carried out this research on another First Nations territory. However, because of the potential negative st stereotyping of their way of speaking English, um, some elders and some community members have requested that I keep the study site confidential. And I'd also like to acknowledge with respect that many of you who are listening in today and will be listening later are residing on a multitude of territories and what we now know as Alberta and elsewhere. So my plan for today is this. I'm gonna start by clarifying some terms because they can be a bit obscure, such as dialect, variety, standard English. And then I'm gonna talk briefly about how speakers of varieties are at risk for unnecessary pathologization. And then I'm gonna talk about the grammatic features that I discovered as part of my research in a school in a small community in Northern BC, what I found that they are, their frequency of use. I'm gonna describe what I found happens in their use over time. I'm gonna talk about mean length of utterance and their use of subordinate clauses. And at the end, and I'm quite excited to get an opportunity to do this for the first time actually, is I'm gonna look at some language samples of First Nations children here in Alberta 
to see if we can find examples of linguistic bias by identifying maybe some potential grammatical features. Um, and I want everybody to be thinking about the implications for standardized testing when we do this. So when non-Indigenous researchers like me uh, study issues that affect First Nations people, it's really important that you position yourself so that any biases that you may have are fully transparent. So I'm obviously, given my 40 years of experience, a baby boomer who was raised in the maritime provinces in a white middle-class home. And although I have used some Indigenous research methodologies, such as the use of personal contact with people when recruiting participants, because in this community, when you talk about important things, it's much better to talk on a face-to-face -face with people than relying particularly on letters or written communication. Um, so I've done some of that, but most of the work is based on Western research methodologies and statistical analysis. And I should say that I believe strongly in um, inclusion and diversity. And I also feel uh, parents do have a role in deciding what their children will be learning in school. So my research is a study of children um, who speak a local First Nations English variety in a school where the language of instruction is Canadian Standard English. And I think this type of research is important because um, there is growing evidence that many people of uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit ancestry in Canada speak varieties or dialects. And because they speak a variety, there may, differences, may be differences in the words that they know and use um, in the form of their English and the way they use uh, language to communicate with others. And these differences may put speakers in danger of unnecessary pathologization. So let's go back to the terms. So what is standard English anyway? Well, it is the one that is codified in dictionaries, grammars, and usage guides. And it's this next thing I want you to think about. It is people with influence who are usually white, such as teachers and employers, who decide what the standard is. But in fact, standard English is really a myth. There are as many versions of the standard as there are people who claim to speak it. So what is a variety or a dialect of English? Well, technically speaking, the technical definition being a given variety of language shared by a group of speakers then the standard is also a dialect. But here's another important thing to think about. A popular definition is a particular social or geographical variety of English that is not the standard one. So for some reason, those of us, uh, those people who've decided what the standard will be, have decided not to call themselves a dialect, but everybody else's version of English a dialect. So I already said that vocabulary, grammar, and social rules of varieties may differ, and differences may affect reading comprehension and writing and oral language, and varieties can be associated with class. People that really enjoyed Downton Abbey would have probably noticed that the folks that lived upstairs spoke English in a different way than the folks that worked in the kitchen. And status and age. There's been research that has um, indicated that folks that speak African American language, um, the elder folks in that group uh, or community, may speak African American language differently than young people in that same community. So dialects have also been associated with social group. Really interesting study done in California, in a high school in California. And um, it was discovered that kids um, spoke differently, spoke English differently, depending on what clique in the high school they attended, um, they, they identified with. Um, varieties are associated with gender. 
uh, with regions. And in Canada, probably uh, the, the regional dialects that we're most familiar with are are those that are spoken in Newfoundland. And in fact, the government of Newfoundland in their tourism commercials that were on the air about, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, were bragging that there were more dialects of English spoken in Newfoundland than anywhere in the world. And I felt that was kind of interesting. And of course, uh, varieties are associated with ethnicity. Next really important point to grasp here, there is variation within a variety. So if there is a group of characteristic features of a variety, not all people in the community that claim to speak the variety will use all the features and they certainly won't use them all at the same rate. So how do varieties come to be? Well, British colonialism was a driving force to create uh, many varieties of English worldwide. They could, some researchers believe, have evolved from pigeons and creoles. Now pigeons are, is a pe pigeon language is a language that develops when two groups of people who speak different languages need to communicate with each other for the purposes of trade or they need to labor together or they need to interact. Um, and so this common language is developed called a pigeon, but of course it's always dominated by the more powerful partner. And if a child um, is born into a home and a pigeon is the first language that they learn, then the child is said to be starting to speak Creole. And that's actually the Creole, the neonate version of the Creole. Um, dialects can arise from whole community shifting from one way of speaking to another. And principles of second language learning play a factor in the development, uh, are a factor in the development of varieties. And of course, universal properties of grammatical simplification and phonological reduction play a role. Variety mixing can happen where one group borrows features from another group. Leveling where uh, two different uh, varieties start becoming more and more similar to each other. And importantly, features of the ancestral language may have carried out to the new version of English. So why do varieties persist? Well, varieties may entrench and persist when speakers of the variety become isolated, either geographically, economically, politically, or socially. But it's this next factor reason that I think makes the most sense to me. It's all about identity. The conscious or unconscious decision to speak in a certain way in order to maintain identity with a particular group may further perpetuate variety. And I've had a personal experience of this because when I graduated uh, in 1980, um, and I took my first job in Newfoundland, and back in those days, of course, we didn't have texting and rapid communications with our families. And I think I was over in Newfoundland uh, for about three months and I phoned home and my mother said, you're speaking like a Newfoundlander. And of course, I didn't intentionally try to do that, but I guess I must have unconsciously wanted to fit in. So I was starting to adopt some of the patterns of speech and the accent. So, as I already said, because people who speak varieties, um, have, there are differences in the vocabulary that they know in their grammar and in their language use that they may be at risk for unnecessary pathologization. So this is really important because if we educators and educate, educational professionals and health professionals don't recognize that First Nation students are speaking a variety and rather are confused and think that their differences are actually indicators of language disorder um, then, or literacy delay, then we really are in danger of a necessary pathologizing student. I know I have done this in my past. I um, know that if this is being done, it's not being done intentionally. Um, it's just that there isn't a lot of information out there. Um, and in fact, studies have recently shown that uh, language differences can uh, be associated with differences with literacy, with 
uh, acquisition. Um, there was, uh, were a number of recent studies published um, that demonstrated that increased use of variety was uh, had a negative association to reading and writing achievement and performance on tests of phonological awareness um, among students who speak varieties in the US. So if we don't know that a student is speaking a variety, um, we might think that the student's lower uh, academic achievement is a learning problem rather than a learning disadvantage. And in fact, there, is, there was a study done by a researcher named Terry, and he found that students who that spoke African American language had more difficulty solving certain word problems in mathematics. I think he retroactively under, uh, analyzed responses on the word problems test on the Woodcock Johnson. I think that was the test that he used. But he found that if the problem contained third person singular S, then children who spoke African American language had more difficulty solving that word math problem. So an example would be, um, every day Mary eat, eats an apple. Um, how many apples does Mary eat in a week? So the word that caused the difficulty for the student was the word eats, third person singular S, because in African American language, one of the characteristics is final cons consonant reduction. So many of those kids might be more used to hearing something like every day Mary eat an apple. And they understand what that means. In fact, studies have shown that speakers of African American language certainly understand standard American English, but the Terry and his colleagues proposed was that extra little bit of translation, that little bit extra cognitive load made it more difficult for them to devote a, their cognitive energy to solving the math problem. And of course, a huge problem is bias, linguistic bias in our standardized assessments. And as I said, at the end of my presentation, I'm hoping to take a look at a test that we're probably all familiar with, the formulated subtest of the self, um, to look for examples of potential linguistic bias. Because if there is a, um, a feature in the response and folks think it is a grammatical error, then they may score the student more poorly than is warranted. So another reason I think this research is important is Ball and Bernhardt so eloquently said it, dialects are important linguistic markers of indigenous identity and solidarity. And if we continue to view varieties as broken English, and by the way, I have heard elders that I have interacted with in my travels in the North refer to the way they speak English as broken English, which is heartbreaking to me. Or if we continue to view grammar differences as mistakes, this can lead to inappropriate teaching, but also very importantly, importantly devaluating, devaluing their English and their identity. So at this point, I'm just going to pause to let people sort of digest what I've said so far. Um, and it might be an opportunity that if you have some questions, you can start to type in and I won't, I'm not going to take the questions till the end of the presentation, but I also want to know, I want you to think about if you've ever felt discriminated against because of the way you speak English, or have you ever observed this in uh, discrimination, someone being discriminated against because of the way they speak and being a Maritimer, I have on occasion felt that I was being judged because of the way I spoke. And it's interesting because I kind of don't even hear my own accent now. Like I know I have this very strong R and, um, and which is another characteristic of varieties which make them tricky because when you speak a variety, you may not even know that you're speaking differently. But we'll talk about that in, in, in later on. So just take a moment of reflection about that, think about it, write down a few questions. We're going to just check and see what time. Oh yeah, good. This is good. I'll have a little drink of water and then we'll get going with part two in about 30 seconds.
Okay, I'm going to carry on. It's probably not quite 30 seconds. Sorry about that. <laughs> but anyway, so part two. So you may have wondered how I got involved with all of this in the first place. Well, I got involved when I was asked to designate students who were ESD. In British Columbia, that's that's a designation category. It stands for English as a second dialect, which is kind of um, an odd name in my opinion. I think it should have been standard English as a second dialect, but however. Um, so these students that would that I would designate um, would receive money uh, from the Ministry of Education of BC and the districts were supposed to use these monies to support students in learning the standard. Um, but I found this was impossible to do because nobody had organized or had studied any features in this community in any organized way and the literature was scant in this regard. So I, I felt like I had an opportunity to do some research and I did feel like I should. And later on in my reading, I did stumble upon this quote which really resonated with me. And it was um, put forward by Wolfram and Ad Adger and Wolfram is uh, one of the fathers of the field um, and he actually created a manual for speech pathologists in Baltimore to use so that they could help document linguistic features of kids that spoke African American language in the schools there. And in that manual, he said, speech and language pathologists, and I'll put educators in that group too, seem to have an unprecedented socio-educational opportunity if not an incumbent responsibility or moral obligation, sorry, to do so. And I do agree with them. I think we are uniquely placed. We do um, because of our regular work with families, develop relationships in communities and trust. And we are there, um, boots on the ground, working day to day. And I, I do think this is something that we all should get more involved with. So the research that I'm going to present to you today is what I feel represents a first step, like the very first layer in this um, process toward charting a course to learning more about First Nations English varieties. And so I humbly present to you what I now know is just this very thin um, exterior layer of the onion. So my research questions were, are students speaking an identifiable local English variety? If so, what are the grammatical features of their variety? And what changes occur in the children's use of features as they progress through the grades in a school where the language of instruction is standard English? And I carried out my study in a small town in Northern British Columbia that I fictitiously referred to as Bigton. I was able to recruit 15 out of 27 students who had been designated as ESD. Six were cisgendered females, nine were males, 14 out of 15 identified as First Nations. <clears throat> and at this point, I wanna point out something. If you're a little kid, and you grow up in a small town and all your friends are speaking a First Nations English variety, then you will also learn to speak a First Nations English variety. So you don't need to be a First Nations person to speak a First Nations English variety. So the ancestral language of most of the children was Dene, or part of the Athabascan family of languages. They were in kindergarten to grade five and they were all receiving ESD services. So, to, in my attempt to answer the first two research questions, namely, are children speaking a variety and what are the features, I first compiled, this was quite a process, I must say, starting from scratch, but I first compiled a list of features by consulting residents and staff, uh, my colleague who was working um, nearby, um, an inventory that had been created by um, another person in another nearby region. Um, by looking language at language samples and observations that I had made 
as part of my own practice. Um, and then as a further layer of corroboration, I consulted experts in Dene to see if they felt that these potential features that I had identified with either may have been influenced by or come from the ancestral language. And then I retroactively analyzed language samples that I had previously cl collected from kindergartners. Now I picked kindergartners to, to hone in on what the features might be because they represented more of a linguistic baseline in my judgment after attendance at school became an overlay in the way they spoke English. So from kindergartens at school entry, and then I refined my inventory after completing a longitudinal study, which I'll talk about in a bit. And I also did take the trouble to do inter-rater reliability for transcription with the folks at SALT, um, as well as my ability to identify complete and intelligible verbal utterances, and did some reliability assessment um, with a colleague to see if I could reliably identify features that I had listed as being in the inventory. And I used the systematic analysis of language transcripts for my analysis. And I collected language samples by asking students to watch short dialogue less videos. And then I asked them to tell me the story of what happened in the video. And this particular video was one that I used and it was made at the Vancouver Film School. Now, what I'm gonna do next is present a series of slides that show the grammatical features. And I'm not gonna linger on the slides. I'm gonna advance through them because this can be kind of a tedious section. But I will stop and talk about certain highlight certain features, um, tell a few stories about them, but mostly just go through the process so you have a, an understanding of the scope and appreciation of the scope of the grammatical differences that I discover being used in this community. So this slide shows the first four verb features. So in this slide, um, what you will see in the first column is the feature this and every other slide, by the way. And then in the second column, you'll see an example. And if there is an X in the third column here, it means that I was able to find an example of it being used by Indigenous American English speakers. And if there's an X in the fourth column, it means I was able to find an example of it being used by other First Nations English speakers in what now is known as Canada, but the literature is scant in this regard. And if there's an X in the fifth column, it means that I was able to find an example of an adult community member using this feature. And if there's an X in the last column, it means that experts in Dene feel this feature could have been influenced by the structure of the ancestral language. So the first feature I wanna draw your attention to is absent copula auxiliary. So an example would be they waiting. And the reason I want to draw your attention to this feature is this is a common feature among a wide variety of English dialects. For example, it's a feature of African American language. It's a feature of Australian Aboriginal English. So some features like this may have uh, originated in a, in a wide variety of um, English dialects because of those maybe processes of phonological reduction, grammatical simplification and so on. But um, the ancestral language does not have a separate word for um, a word equivalent to a copula or an auxiliary. And in fact, in Athabascan languages, they're organized so differently than English. There is a root word, perhaps a root verb word, to which many prefixes are added. And all those prefixes code meaning. Um, so, you know, it may have been just an offshoot of an evolution from the ancestral language in this case. So the second category is what I called present for past, and it really represents two categories. One of them is uninflected past tense, such as he looked there yesterday. And by the way, uninflected past tense is a hallmark feature of Indigenous American Englishes. And I also put in that category because I could not disambiguate the two. 
is what is more like historical present, which is a use of present tense to code past tense events. And the reason why I ended up combining the two is because I couldn't tell the difference. So for this sake of this analysis, those are all in that one category. And that'll have to wait for another day to try to dis, dis, um, untangle those two. Um, and absent third person singular um, was, I thought, a feature. Absent ing ending. Um, other verb features were regularization, like her blowed that, the balloon spended it, he kicked it, the ball. Um, an absent two in the infinitive, she was waiting for the girl come back. Subject verb agreement differences, they was coming. And the use of gots for has, the woman got saw. So I noticed two major pronoun differences, and one was the use of undifferentiated pronoun case way longer than you would expect kids to use that form, um, such as her blew that to him, them are in the lake. Um, I, I say way longer than in that, you know, children who speak standard Canadian English also use that form, but are finished using that form at a much younger age. Um, and gender neutral pronoun. So the use of he when referring to uh, a girl. So the use of he instead of she um, in the third person singular, uh, third person. Um, so the example I've got is he is trying to catch it instead of she is trying to catch it. Now, this probably, both experts and Danny feel, this probably came directly from the ancestral language because the ancestral language does not differentiate gender for third person. Um, and by the way, I have subsequently found out that you don't differentiate gender in third person in Finnish either. And when you think about it, we don't differentiate gender for third person in the plural form, form either in pro, when we're using pronouns. Um, there are lots of differences with determiners and articles because like, for example, articles aren't even used in Athabascan languages in the way they're used in standard English. Um, prepositions, difference in the way prepositions were used was interesting. So the one example I have here is the girl got along the way instead of the girl got out of the way. This feature was fascinating to me. When you're hearing a child who speaks a more standard English retell a story, you might hear the child say, and then this happened, uh, and then this happened, and then this happened. Many of the children in this community said, here this happened, and here this happened, or then here this happened. And I couldn't find an example of this being used anywhere. And I was asking around and I wondered for a long time if this was unique to this community. And I finally found an example of it being used by an indigenous speaker in the Yukon. Um, and why is this happening? Was this a uh, uh, literary device? because I have learned subsequently that the hallmark of a really good Indigenous storyteller is one who transports the listener to the scene of the, of the story. Or is this related to the fact that in this culture, landscape and space is way more important than time? I don't know, total speculation. That would be a great research study right there, that one feature. And of course, there were differences in non-verb related morphology, such as possession and plurals and negation. And there were differences that seemed to affect the utterance. Um, the first one I noticed was this tendency to omit a whole subject, verb, or object phrase. So the example I've got here is waiting for her to come. So the, the subject phrase is omitted here. And in this case, the auxiliary is also admitted. Um, the next um, feature that I have called string, and I'm not happy with that name, but it was inspired by reading a participant's observation who was um, who took took part in a First Nations English dialect forum that ha was held in Vancouver in 2006, and. Uh, that participant described hearing children string phrases together 
And I saw a similar pat pattern. <clears throat> so in this case, the example I've got is and they, they come out and help and sit down and have more apples. Or you could have just as easily had and then they come out, help, sit down, have more apples. So there, there were three other more utterance level features that I identified. One was topicalization, where you set the topic and expand, such as that bull, he was mad. Or repetition for emphasis or continued action, like he got really mad and really, really mad, and jump, jump, jump on. Or different word order, that you see she have a balloon instead of you see that she has a balloon. Now, this is interesting. So, of course, I had these 23 features that I had come up with as an inventory, and I did all my reliability assessment on those 23 features. But there were all, also things that didn't quite fit into any of those categories, so I just marked them other. And when I went back and looked at all those others, I saw other patterns emerge that I just hadn't no noticed, despite quite a bit of experience in this com community and quite a bit of experience looking at language samples. And one of them, for example, was the use of definite articles to modify body parts. So um, you might have an example. He hit the head instead of he hit his head. So it sort of reminded me of French in a way. I apologize if I've got that wrong, but it just goes to show you that even if you've had a ton of experience, things may not necessarily pop out at you unless you really drill down and do some more systematic research. So this slide here uh, shows a cumulative percentage curve of the percentage of use of each individual feature. So you can see that four features, and these are undifferentiated pronoun case, absent copula auxiliary, absent phrase, and regularization accounted for 50% of all feature use. And this is when I had a complete aha moment when I looked at this graph. To tell you the truth, I'm a less fussy person when it comes to graphs. And it was my husband that convinced me to put that curve in there and went, mm, I'm glad he did because it popped out at me. Oh my gosh, all four of those features can all also be associated with language disorder. So no wonder people get confused about what's going on here and maybe leap to the conclusion that this child has a language disorder when maybe they don't have a language disorder at all. And this is the same data. I'm a perfectionist. The kindergartners were the first samples that I analyzed and I wanted to make sure I was correct. So I recalibrated my results after I'd finished. And I um, analyzed them in a way that many researchers use, which is a features per utterance metric. And I got essentially the same result. I mean, there are some slight variations, but the top four features are still the top four features. So to support the notion, however, that these features were actually evidence of variety rather than evidence of language disorder, I investigated whether students who had no history of speech and language intervention or no help from special ed or no designation um, produced these features. So this slide of stack columns shows um, the percentage of words marked with features um, for kids who never received special education services, and they're indicated by the open part of these stack columns, versus the percentage of words marked with features um, produced by kids who did receive special education service, and they're indicated by the filled columns. And you can see that most kids who never, who are typically developing, who never got special education help um, or support uh, produce most features. But I want you to take a look at these two, which I find particularly interesting because with a ratio of eight kids who never received special education services versus 
um, sorry, ratio of eight kids who received special education services versus, versus um, <clears throat> five kids who never received services. Sorry, I'm gonna have to take a drink of water. Talking too much. <laughs> um, you would expect if all the kids are using features at the same rate, that these columns would distribute themselves in kind of that ratio eight to five. And with these two features, they're not. So I'm wondering if these are two features, at least in this community, that could be used as sort of indicator features that if a kid came into kindergarten using a lot of these two types, that we would keep an eye on those kids to make sure they're developing language as expected. Um, to make sure they're not what we call kids with disorder within dialect. Because while we don't want to over pathologize, we don't want to miss ki kids that need our specialized help either. So this is just the same analysis, the same data analyzed after recalibrating and with this other um, metric. So I also looked at something called variety density measure. So I looked at variety density measure for each individual child. Here they all are here at the bottom of the graph. And I did two measurements. I measured as indicated by the left-hand column, the number of words marked with feature, percentage of words marked with features in their sample. And the right-hand column were the percentage of utterances in their sample that contained at least one feature. So the first five students are students that are no SPED students, and the last eight that are stippled are the SPED students. And here is a clearer way to see the two groups again analyzed in the features per utterance metric. So you can see there's a lot of overlap between the two groups, but you're probably also looking at the SPED students and thinking, hmm, it looks like they're using them more frequently, and I wondered the same thing. So I did do a t-test on the percentage of words marked with features and the percentage of utterances with features for the two groups, and they were not significantly different from each other. However, look at the p-value for percentage of words with features, pretty close to significant. So I did calculate an effect size, and I found a strong effect. So maybe students that come into kindergarten and they're using lots of features, maybe they're students that we want to keep an eye on too to make sure they're developing and not struggling in school. Um, those are all, both token type analyses. But you could also do type type analyses. And so I did do one of those. I looked at the percentage of different types of features that students used and compared the performance of the two groups. And again, I found no significant difference, but a p-value of 0 0.08, I did do an effect size measurement, very small n, right? So, and it was strong. So again, this could be another thing we look at when kids come into kindergarten. Do they use a lot of different types of features in this lit inventory? And if they do, maybe we'll keep an eye on them to make sure they're not in need of our specialized help. So I'm going to stop again there, um, have another drink of water, and I want you to tell me, and please write this down somewhere, if you've noticed any of the features I've listed as perhaps being features of um, this community where you've practiced. So I'm just going to give you a minute to do that. You can also drop, jot down some questions now if you'd like. And I apologize for my very squeaky chair.
Okay, I think I'm going to get started for the part three. So, to answer my third research question, namely what changes are occurring in the children's use of features as they progress through the grades at Bigton School, I collected oral narratives and written narratives from kids in kindergarten to grade five over a three year period. And this is the results. These are the results of this analysis and the research I did in this regard. So this is the longitudinal study. So overall, I found a reduction in use of features. Some features declined, some features fluctuated in their use somewhat, but some features increased. And these were present for past, string, and topicalization. Now, I next explored the overall density with which all the children used features at the various time periods. And as indicated by the zebra striped bar, this is the average percentage of words marked with features at kindergarten entry. And this is the average of percentage of words marked with features at the end of kindergarten and the end of grade one end of grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six, grade seven. And this is a graph of the same results with a line of best fit inserted. And the R squared value was 0 0.92, which means that 92% of the variability explained is explained by this uh, line of best fit, which is polynomial. Just really good result. And what I was thrilled with when I actually printed out this result for the first time, I couldn't believe it because when you're doing research, those who have experience with this, often you're sort of wading into a bit of unknown territory and you're not really even sure what kind of result you're gonna get. And um, I was quite surprised and I, I did the same result for the, each individual year and the same pattern was appearing. And what was really neat about this is this aligns with what researchers of African-American language have recently found. That when kids enter school, the um, frequency with which they use feature declines rapidly. Uh, in my case, it bottomed out about grade three and four. And then as the kids approach middle school, they start to rise again. And the case of Von Hofwigen and Wolfram, um, who studied African-American language speakers, this frequency use continued to rise in high school, um, or it rose in high school and then dropped off just toward graduation. So what is thought is this, that as students enter the school and they identify with the English being spoken by their teachers, with the English that they're reading in the textbooks, that they start to decrease their use of features at school. But as they approach their teenage years and they're forming their identity, they tend to use features that are being used by other community members because they're identifying with the Bigton community. And so this part here is healthy, it's developmental, and we need to be aware of that if this occurs among all our students and celebrate it. So you may be wondering what happened to the kids, um, the two groups, the SPED versus no SPED, groups after the kids have been in school for a while. Well, as you can see from this graph, most of the differences disappeared. And in fact, when I did a t-test here, the p-value was 0.94, which means the groups were essentially the same overall in the frequency with which they used features. And I also mentioned that I collected written language samples. And although I haven't really done a whole lot of research or analysis of the written samples I obtained yet, 
Um, you can see from this graph that most of the features that were used in the children's oral language showed up in their writing. And I want you to take a particular look at this present for past result. Um, clearly, that was uh, a much more um, salient feature and it actually increased in its use over time. And subsequently from reading more literature, this doesn't surprise me. Um, Snell and Andrews are uh, researchers from the UK and they recently published um, an article about um, the acquisition of more formal standard English in the UK and found that most of the regional features um, are the children learn standard English pretty pretty readily there, but verb tense is the most resistant to change they found. So I did say too that I wanted to look at mean length of utterance. So I had 10 students that were randomly sampled, also uh, complete one of the protocols from the SALT program, the story retail protocol. And I compared their results from mean length of utterance to uh, age match peers in the SALT norms. And I found, as expected, their mean length of utterance was shorter, which is what you would expect because they're not speaking English in the same way and they don't necessarily use the same number of words or morphological endings. And I also did uh, analysis of subordination index and found that uh, that was less than age match peers as well. Um, so we can't use the norms for uh, mean length of utterance or subordination index for, for, for probably First Nation students. That was a lesson learned from that exercise. Um, I, I have subsequently heard other people say that this uh, preference for not using uh, subordinate clauses or embedding um, seems to be a characteristic of um, their community's way of speaking English too. But despite the fact that the mean length of utterance may be shorter because of the different way the kids speak English, it did change over time. So it did increase in length over time. So this is MLU in words, and this is MLU in morphemes, so going forward, what's next? Well, just a few words about verb tense. If it is the case that communities wish that their children be very fluent in more formal English, and we need to check that out. We need to find out if that is the wish of the community. It's presumptuous and really a colonial stance. If we just assume that they want that. I certainly know that in my community, that is the wish. They want their kids to be what we call bi-dialectal. So they are fluent in their community English as well as this more formal English because they want their kids to be competitive. Like I, I remember an elder saying that, you know, our kids have to be perfect because they've got to get into medical school. Um, but you know, we do need to consult the community. In BC, we have a bit of, a, uh, we are able to do that because about 10 years ago, the Ministry of Education started creating these Aboriginal enhancement agreements. Um, and so that was when community and school and a facilitator sat down and agreed about what is going to be taught in schools. Um, so those are no longer being facilitated by Min Ministry of Education in BC, and I do worry about individual districts keeping up with that, but so far um, the ones that I've looked at have been. Um, so as I said, verb tense may require direct instruction, and we have to use respectful te teaching techniques, and there are some out there that are evidence-based. One of them is recasting, which is what we all know as rephrasing or recasting. So if a student just um, produces a sentence that has a feature in it, as the adult, you just repeat that sentence using a more formal standard English model. Do not correct because correcting um, devalues their English. Um, and as I say, this technique is being used more frequently with other um, uh, 
varieties in the U.S. And if anybody wants to know some literature or get some resources from me, I'm happy to do that for folks later. The, the image here on the bottom left, you probably can't make out what that is. And you're wondering, well, when I demonstrate for teachers how to do this recasting, I go in to kindergarten, grade one, grade two, and I sit the kids down in a circle and I start off the story. One day, a moose walked into the store and I have each student carry on with the next part of the um, story and they love that. They make up funny things and they squeal with laughter at their jokes and it gives me an opportunity just to recast what they're saying. And I wondered one day, wonder if this has ever happened. So I actually Googled it and I found that this is a screenshot of an image taken by a customer in a grocery store in Smithers. So actually moose do go into grocery stores. So I'm not so far off. So the other evidence-based way of respectfully teaching kids the standard is to use something called contrastive analysis and code switching. And this is done with kids that speak African-American English. It's been done with kids that speak Cypriot Greek and they have to go to school in standard Greek. And all that means is that you compare and contrast the way ideas are expressed in the home community English version versus more formal English. And I have found, as I think I said previously, that this is really interesting because sometimes kids don't even hear that they're doing things differently. And I, I have this wheel here because I set the stage for kids by talking about just what I shared with you, what are dialects, what are varieties of English. And I have all kinds of different varieties of English on this wheel. And as you can see, I've got standard English as just one spoke of the wheel, so as not to give it any more prestige than any other version of English. And of course, assessment is a big area of difficulty and you're probably sick of hearing, we need more culturally appropriate assessment tools. And it's gonna be, in my opinion, difficult to, to get these put together um, because every community may be slightly different, although there may be overlap because I found a great deal of overlap in what I identified in my community with what has been identified um, as being characteristic of Af Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal English, African American English, and so on. Um, dynamic assessment is found to be a good way to assess kids. Um, and good old Alberta, Kramer et al. Um, found that the dynamic assessment and intervention task, um, a culturally sensitive narrative culturally sensitive narrative assessment tool successfully identified grade three First Nations children living in Alberta who had learning difficulties. So that's something to look at and I can give you the reference later if anyone's interested and doesn't know about that study. But this next thing is of great interest to me too, a non-word repetition task. These kinds of tasks are supposed to get away from linguistic bias and the tills has one. And so I've been experimenting with using that and I was inspired because I was talking to a woman who uh, works for Finesque. She's a speech path that works for Finesque and Finesque stands for First Nations Education Steering Committee. And they're the, the gang that work with kids um, who are in federally funded school, schools, which we sometimes call banned schools and they're thinking of using that type test test to kind of tease out which are kids that really need our specialized help and which are kids that are actually just speaking a variety. So I've already said we can't have to avoid using norms for mean length of utterance. That's abundantly clear to me now and subordination index we can't because the English is different so the MLU is different and you know we really do have to try to become familiar with local features and as I've said all along, in our effort not to over pathologize, we can't under diagnose either. So it's a fine balance. And finally, 
the simplest little thing we can do is stop using the word mistake. Rather, we should use the word difference when we're talking about um, these grammatical distinctions. Because I am just so worried about what message we're sending to kids if they say something and they hear that's a mistake and they know their family members speak that way. Um, I'm just worried about that that could be kind of damaging if we're wrong. And I've talked about the need for us to do research. And I know it's not easy to do, but it can be done. And we are uniquely positioned to do this. Like I was thinking if you were in a clinic or you were in a health unit, would it be possible for folks to just start collecting samples? And maybe if there was a grammatical difference, you did what I did and marked it as other. And you know, you collect basic information about the age of the child, etc., cetera, um, where they live. And then maybe at the end of the year, you take a look at that and say, oh, are there some patterns here emerging that we just individually didn't notice, but collectively we notice? Um, maybe these are features, I don't know. Uh, that was just a thought that I had when I was preparing for this. I mean, the beauty of doing these presentations is that every time I do one, I think of something more deeply and I get more ideas from people. So it's a good thing. So like I said, here's my chance to look for linguistic bias. So I have been generously uh, provided with four samples of um, the formulated sentences subtest of self four, self five that were collected from indigenous students somewhere here in Alberta. So I just haven't received these for very long. And these are just a first impression of, oh, I wonder, um, with these four language samples that I've received. Um, and so here's the first aha moment I had. This is a seven-year-old female, and this was taken from the cell four, and the target word was for God. And the student said to bring my hat with me. And prior to doing this work, I would have said that's a fragment. But now, because I'm familiar with the pattern of speech in the community that I'm familiar with, I'm wondering if this is an absent phrase. I don't know, it may not be. But see, this would be interesting to collect this over time to see if this there's a pattern of this that seems to be unique to this community. Um, the next word is car. These kids are getting picked, and then it was just, these kids are getting picked. Three of the kids are running inside the car. So are these examples of uh, preposition differences? Um, I think this should have been the kids are running toward the car. Um, I wonder about that one. Gave. These kids are gaved cereal. Is this way of forming um, irregular past tense appearing among other kids? Um, is this regularization? I wonder. Um, never. These kids are walking on the road and the grandpa is picking them up with the dog for a walk to pick up his daughters on the way back off school. Is that a, is that a preposition feature? Is that is that a feature, a different way of using prepositions? And the last one, running. The kids are running and see who will win, the red team or the blue team. So was this, did this child mean to say, the kids are running to see who will win? So is this a different use of infinitive? And guess what? Um, Jenny and Stigder did an analysis of college students who were who spoke Blackfoot English and also looked at a transcript of an elder, a Blackfoot elder, and they talk in their article about infinitives and the different way infinitives are derived, which makes me wonder about that one. Is that a feature? Or I had did see when I read the article an example of the ing ending not being used. Um, so again, is that is that a feature? Um, and here's, and I, by the way, I haven't, of course, recorded all the responses. I only 
I only am presenting responses that I wondered about, that maybe that's a feature. Um, quickly, seven-year-old male on the cell five. Quickly, the girl going out soccer. Again, to me, that's a classic case of absent copula auxiliary. And I've already explained to you that's a very common feature among a lot, many varieties. And it's indicated, Jenna and Stigter, when they studied Blackfoot English, indicated that's a feature of the Blackfoot English. Um, and there's that infinitive thing again, go, going out to play soccer, the infinitive isn't there at all. When, when he got fall down on the bike, um, is that a way of forming, deriving pat, past irregular tense, got fall instead of fell? Don't know. You'd have to see if other kids use that form. Um, best, the best is people, both of them. That, hmm, is that an, a different version of topicalization? Um, is that a feature? Does it her, happen a lot in this community when people are speaking English? They structure their sentences that way. And car, the girl is dropping the boys instead of the girl is dropping off the boys or dropping the boys off. Again, is that a preposition difference? And here's an eight-year-old female. Um, children, this is on the South Four. The children's are playing video games. And the second one contains something similar, car. The children's are going to the car to get picked up from school. Now this clinician very cleverly spoke to someone in the community to see if this is typical for kids when they're forming the plural of children. Well, children is the plural, this overgeneralization. Um, and that person didn't think so, but other people might think about that because I think Jenny and Stigder mentioned this as an example. Well, here, this example was in their article of the way a Blackfoot English speaker might derive uh, a plural, like there's a mention of cattles in their article being used. Um, gave, the man gave the food for the boy. Again, to the boy. Is that a preposition difference? Um, and then the next one, and the target is and. I'd and my grandma, grandma, grandma and grandpa, and they bring the dog to the garden. That's a pretty clear case of a regular past tense. Sorry, regularization. Um, and so, you know, it's you'd start to wonder, is that happening pretty typically for eight-year-olds normally? And it certainly ha happens in my community with older school age children, regularization. So is that a feature? And the last target is before. I went at the store before, instead of went to another preposition. Preposition differences seem to be coming up all over the place here. And then the last sample I've included uh, of a nine year old female, and I've included it because I actually didn't see anything jump out at me in this sample as being possibly a feature at all. Again, first impressions, maybe you see something, um, but here it is before. Before they're done scanning, the old lady can scan her food. Um, maybe it's the wrong conjunction or the conjunctions are used inappropriately. When they are done scanning would be more appropriate. Um, I don't know if that's a feature. Um, until the shop opens, she can buy a bicycle when the shop opens, maybe more appropriate. Um, otherwise, instead of paying as friends pay for the food, neither, neither, I don't know. I guess that child student couldn't generate a sentence with neither. Um, and however, the students, um, I can't make up the rest of that sentence that's covered up. However, the students are doing a project with their science teacher. So I don't see any necessary uh, features there. So let's skip back because there were features for the seven-year-olds. There were some features for the eight-year-olds and none for the nine. So does this jive with what I found? So I'm just going to skip back to, I think it's right here, yes. So in my community, as you can see, um, when kids are in grade three and four, I guess your nine-year-old would 
be a child in grade four, um, and the eight-year-old would be a child in grade three, and the seven-year-olds would likely be in a in about grade two, not exactly, but grade two, I'll just say. And so it's kind of following the same pattern. We've got more features in grade two than we have in grade four, just these particular samples being pulled to take a look at. So that's interesting to me. Um, gosh, there's so much to learn. As I said, this is just a first impression. So um, yeah, there's lots to be done. So I would encourage you to think about starting to collect this information in a more organized way so that we can be really accurate with kids about uh, finding out which kids really need our specialized help and maybe kids that um, don't necessarily. Okay, so that's all I was going to say today. So I'm assuming someone will take the reins and uh, I'll be waiting for Sandy to maybe ask me some questions. <laughs> you will be waiting. <laughs> so it's it's me again, Pat, and I'll just be the, um, I always forewarn people, I'll just be the voice in the night here, and that okay. way we can leave you up on the screen. And okay. um, we have several questions that have rolled in and, and some comments as well. Cool. And I'll just preface letting folks know that the slide deck um, will be posted along with the recordings. So that'll show up probably within the next couple of days on the YouTube channel. So if you feel like you've missed some slides or um, need some quotes off those slides, they'll be posted for everybody to see. Um, okay, yes, where to start? So, um, definitely we had, you know, Pat, you asked the you asked the question, you know, if if any of our members had felt um, that maybe they had been um, um, singled out or discriminated against because of the way they use their language and it's quite fascinating a number of our our of our attendees definitely said yeah so you know mm. there's a couple of comments in that window saying yeah i feel like people judge my english whether they're an immigrant or you don't sound like you come from mm. mm -hmm. a particular place so i would I think that's probably more of a comment i'm not sure if you want to say anything I, extra there I, I i would like to comment on that um, there is a, uh, an academic, a scholar named Lippy Green, and she talks about the fact that it is not acceptable anymore to show outward discrimination, except when it comes to the way we speak. We still seem to be able to get away with that form of discrimination. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, yeah, we have to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Because, you know, it's, it's so silly for us because we are all in the business of language learning, right? And, and helping kids communicate. And we don't really care how polished it is as long as a child can express themselves. And so it, I find it hard to um, understand why that would even matter and get really militant now when I'm uh, talking with folks out west here and I um, get someone to correct me if I describe that little white delicious seafood that's a bivalve um, that is a little white disc and they say it's not a scallop it's a scallop I say hey if you're eating that and that came from Digby Nova Scotia that is a scallop <laughs> so, <laughs> ah dear anyway yeah. those maritimers out there and i can imagine there might be a few of them there are probably laughing right now <laughs> what i just said there might be so we did have a question really early on and i think you've addressed this that it was really before you got into the meat of your presentation which was what are the gra grammatical differences that indigenous children make so i think you've probably covered that off in i just your want to make and mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that while I am highly suspicious that there's probably overlap, there will probably be differences. And I'm reminded of that when I took another look at Jenny and Stichter in preparation for this presentation, presentation, because in my community, what I'm seeing is a mission of the word two in the infinitive. But I believe, and I'm not a linguist, so I hope I'm interpreting their work properly, that they talk about more um, differences concerning the infinitives, including, I think, I hope I'm getting this correct, 
and complete emission of the infinitive form, which in their article, which is really cool, is they link all the present day way of speaking English to uh, Blackfoot um, and draw parallels about how the structure of the Blackfoot language um, may have um, leaked into um, English. That was the word of a linguist that I heard um, at a at a linguistics conference I attended. So yeah, there's probably overlap, but there are also probably regional differences or differences in communities about what they have adopted for their English. Sure, sure. So that, um, you know, you've um, kind of segued into a number of uh, themes, I'm going to say that we're, we're in the chat box, is really around the references. Some people were looking for specific references, Pat, and I'm not sure if um, maybe you're able to provide a reference list. So, of course, you had talked about um, the reference I'll probably have a hard time finding it here, but just around dynamic assessment in Alberta. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think like some of those would be great. We've also had, um, um, you know, and some folks can probably find some of these references as well. But um, you know, practicing members don't always have easy access to library yeah. types of information. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a reference list that would be awesome. I, to I'm happy to if with if if we can have a chance to go through these uh, questions. I am happy to generate a reference list for you, and then maybe it can be posted along with that brochure. Do, do, are folks aware they're going to get a brochure, or do have they not. already? Ah. They're not. So you are more than welcome to speak a little bit about that if you'd like. So that is one of the resources that Pat is sharing with us. Okay, so I'm going to just reduce this and find what I'm going to provide for you folks. Um, it would be right here. And it's this one. So I made up this little cheat sheet, differences, not mistakes, with some of the highlights of the main points that I made today. And on the back, you'll see a list of features and some examples so that um, everyone will have access to that brochure at the end of Great. this presentation. Great, I think our members will be thrilled to have that. So that's fantastic. Okay. Okay, now let's see if I can get into some of the more meatier questions that we had here. Uh oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So somebody's got um, on slide 40. Mm. So we'll want to take us back to slide 40. How did you assess for the kids who were deemed typically developing? If you were looking at adult models for what's typical, how did you ensure that those adults did not also have language disorders? Ah, interesting. Okay, two parts to that question. Um, what I did to distinguish the groups is I looked at their school records and up until the termination of this study, if they had not been designated, if there had been no history of receiving SLP services, if they had not received special education services as indicated in their files, and these are pretty small schools, so it's easier to find the people to talk to to verify this information, but that's what I did to determine if, if through the after kindergarten entry until the termination of this study, depending on what grade they were in, they had not received special education services. Now, as far as the adults are concerned, um, because I had not made any agreement um, to act, I did not assess adults, I did not collect samples. What I did was there are um, published narratives of adults telling stories. So I looked at the published narratives that I could find to see if I could find examples of the same form that I saw the children use using that the adults were using. So they would be transcripts of adults telling stories. So hopefully that answers the questions. Mm. Good. And the next um, the next question we have might be more of a comment, but somebody had noted I can see phonemic awareness would be affected when tested in the standard language and could somewhat be discounted as errors if knowledge of dialectical difference are known. 
Listen. I wonder whether, sorry, yeah. I'll, no, um, keep going. I'll finish sorry. it off. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's evidence, however, of a benefit or a disadvantage of developing, in quoting fingers, normal phonemic awareness skills among people who learn two languages, or as in this case, a dialect who are also exposed to a standard language at an early age. Okay. There's quite a bit of literature about this, and it's mostly um from research being done with kids that speak african american language the, uh, for when when craig and washington created this way of looking at dialect as a dial what they called the dialect um density measure which i call variety density measure um they finally started to see relationship between um the frequency with which kids used uh, features and their ability to actually hear these differences on tests that were standardized on standard American English. And I, interestingly, I think it's um, Craig et al. in 2010 found that as students, and I may have the wrong year because there's all there are three or four groups of people that were doing quite a bit of research all around the same period of time, but I can look that up later and find the exact uh, study. But one of the studies showed that as students became more familiar with standard American English, they were more able to just their performance on phonological awareness improved. So yeah, I mean, kids can learn to distinguish these differences. Um, but, you know, when they come into school, if they're not, if they haven't got that map down, if they have not heard that, then yeah, it's going to be difficult for he, for them to perform as well as a student who grew up in a standard English home can hear the difference. So yeah, I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So there's a couple more questions here. I'm going to save one that I think is the best one for last. So I guess I get some, <laughs> Good, some power. Say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So have you seen differences in FNED in communities that have many speakers of their Indigenous language versus communities with less speakers who are fluent in their Indigenous language? This is so interesting because um, as part of this whole research pro process, I had numerous community meetings. So, um, and I was advised that if I wanted elders to come so that they could give me some feedback and that they would know what was going on and what I was exploring, um, that I should give them a personal invitation. Well, um, that wasn't always possible for me to do, but I telephoned people and I got in some really, really good conversations with folks. And I remember, um, I feel that those, those elders, there are so few of them and they're, you know, they're elderly and they're called upon to make so many important decisions for their nation. And they are so busy. They're way busier in the evening than I am. I don't know how they do it. And I remember um, talking to an elder who was involved in actually traveling to a nearby community because they were um, they were involved in the language nest of that community. And then I explained to them about this that I was studying and they said to me, oh my gosh, our kids now have to be fluent in three languages. So I'm not directly answering your question but I have never been in a situation where this research was done in a town where most people are not speaking their ancestral language. So it's kind of not relevant, but it did raise an issue of, I remember the elders said at one point, maybe we shouldn't be teaching our kids their ancestral language. And I went, oh no, yes, you should. Yes, 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 yes. Um, but no, I don't have any personal experience with that situation. I, I um, so I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that that whole multilingual thing is uh, a lot for kids to learn. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to ask this question that I think um, for me, it, it sort of sums it up. So the question is, do you feel that these differences can be generalized to First Nations communities across Canada? OK, so the so there are two answers to that question. 
don't know for sure, but I'm getting feedback when I speak to people that, including when I spoke in Halifax, that people did see overlap. Um, and I'm wondering about it because there is overlap. I think there was something like 87% of the features that I identified also appeared in other varieties whose ancestral language may not even be known or might be quite different, like an, a, um, Australian Aboriginal English, like African American English and so on. Um, so I do suspect that there may be overlap, but we don't know until we start collecting local data. Um, so what I'm hoping is that people will raise their awareness of potential differences by looking at my list. But what really needs to happen is people have to start being a little bit more organized and getting together and creating inventories to see if that is the truth. But what I would advise people to do is when you're using standardized tests, as I said, use that list as a guide and think, hmm, maybe these really aren't errors and maybe this child doesn't deserve to lose a point on this particular question on the um, self-formulated sentences. Now we cannot change the method that, that we use to apply a test. It has to be applied in the standardized method or otherwise the results are invalid. So what I've been doing is I always put a caveat when compared to other students in North America who speak a more a formal standard English, this is how this student performed, but it may be an underestimate of their ability because there may be some um, First Nations variety of varietal features being used. That's how I get around it. That's great. I bet lots of our members um, and attendees will rewind that piece of the recording to, <laughs> to, to get that little slip of information, which is fantastic. So Pat, I'm not seeing more questions, not specific questions in the in the chat window. I think um, lots of our members have indicated that they have seen these features in the communities in which they're working. Excellent. So that's that's great feedback. And I know that um, we've had some comments from attendees. They love the brochure already. And so oh, they'll good. be very grateful to have that. And I think just in, I would say, uh, you know kind of a theme to say thank you so much for your time it's very good information it's timely information it's good information and i think highly highly useful for our members who are um, out there in the field yeah. working and 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 um, seeing these children on a daily basis so um, I think with no further questions, um, I will draw us to a close and I will say thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. We will, um, I think, for sure be looking for a reference list from you because, okay. of course, you know, that, that'll help, I think, folks yeah. find um, the things that you're referencing. And um, um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be interested, interested in watching your research as it continues to unfold. Thank you so much, everybody. Really Thanks a appreciate lot. the opportunity. Bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Take care.